Okay, so if everybody could come on camera, that would be great. Justice and Kristen, if you guys could come on camera. And then I need to see everybody's face. Janae, I, I don't know what I'm looking at. Um, Brittany. Okay, there you all are. Okay, so it's hard to believe we're in week six, is it not? Almost halfway done. It is too, almost done, yeah. It's just flying. This term is just flying. So I uh, just want to review a couple of things. Well, first of all, does anybody have any questions since we're in week six? Anybody have any questions about anything? Oh, sorry. Um, how is everybody, um, how are we doing on our group project? Everybody at least made contact with the rest of their group and are coming up with a plan. Uh, yeah, we're basically done. Oh, good. Great. So if you're having any issues with any particular students that are not responding or not participating, somebody in the group, just shoot me an email. Okay, please. Um, so I can help facilitate that. Uh, Cause obviously we want everybody to participate. It is a group project. Okay. It's not due. And just to remind everybody um, with the instructions, there are no peer, there's two, there's two change. Well, let me, there's two changes to the instructions. One is uh, I couldn't, I tried to get a change before the term started and it didn't change. One is there are no peer reviews, okay? There's no peer reviews, there's no peer responses, okay? Second is it's not due, because there are no peer responses or reviews, I didn't make it due until Sunday. All right, so you get four extra days. Is this, this is the group project, right? Mm -hmm. Let me pull this up real quick and show you. Okay, let's do in week seven. So here we, you guys should be able to see my screen. Here were the instructions. Okay, actually three things. Each group will be chosen by an instructor, um, infectious disease to present during class in week eight. I'm not sure we're going to do that. If we have time, we will. Okay. Typically what I do if we have time in week eight is we do mini, just a couple of minutes, just each group going through. Uh, it's not a formal presentation. It's just each, each group going through what they did. Okay. So if we have time, we will do that in week eight. Okay. Remember, this is a paper. This is a written paper. This is not your PowerPoint. Okay, this is a paper. Okay, it says it's due on Wednesday. It's due on Sunday. And your due date is in the assignments, the correct due date. And it says peer evaluations will be submitted. There are no peer evaluations. Okay, so the paper should include information regarding transmission, ways we uh, attempt to control transmission, what type of surveillance by state depart state health departments and CDC, and common treatment approaches, which is all right down here in the rubric. Okay, so I don't want, don't want you to confuse this project with your other projects, right? This is a paper. So everybody needs to turn in the final copy. I realize it's there are going to be four of the same papers. I get that. I get that. But everybody needs to turn it in so it hits the grade book. If you don't turn it in, it's going to show as not submitted. All right. So everybody needs to turn it in. Any questions about that? So not doodle Sunday, no peer responses. And if we have time in week eight, we'll go through many presentations of what you did. I don't okay. have any questions about that, but I do have a question. When will we start our HESTI review or when will we get, do we, do we have like a concept on the HESTI in our modules at the moment? Well, all the concepts are on your HESTI. And you know, your that was the second thing I was going to bring up is your HESTI review document that you have due in week nine, right? 
We're going to go through that in class today after I finish with the content. That's this. Your HESI prep. Okay. We're going to, I want everybody to pull that up. Not now, but be prepared to pull it up um, because we're going to talk about this um, after we finish the lecture portion. Okay. Because everybody should be working on this. There's lots of concepts in this that can be completed already. Lots of boxes can be completed. All right, so we're gonna talk about that today. And then if we have time, I just wanna uh, go through how your exam two concept guide is outlined. Okay, everybody should have received that last week. All right, you already have your study guide for exam two. Okay, I'm doing a review after class. Um, let's see, we finish at three, I think my, I think uh, we finished at 2.30. I think my exam reviews at three. So I'm doing the first of three exam reviews. Um, there's another one Thursday. And I believe Professor Kershaw, I haven't sent out the announcement yet, but she has changed hers from Sunday to Saturday morning. So I'll send that out after. Um, the other thing I told the group yesterday, uh, my group yesterday with regards to the HESI prep is I'll send out a sample of a completed HESI prep from a prior term, just so you guys can see how it's done. Or, but we'll talk about that when we get there. I have more to say about that. Um, so you've got your, so it's week six, come week eight, it's gonna start to get real busy for you guys, right? Week nine, we have, um, well, week seven, you have your group project, right? Then week nine, you have your HESI review, your HESI uh, prep assignment that's due. And then in week 10, you have your vulnerable populations assignment. Okay, that assignment is done by its individual assignment and that's your PowerPoint. Right. So if you need if you need to read about the guidelines, go to week 10. OK, this is a PowerPoint where you're picking a vulnerable population in your community. Right. So don't do it on, you know, say homeless in all the United States or teen preg pregnancy in all the United States. This is meant to be a vulnerable population within your zip code that you research within your community. OK. That's the PowerPoint. Okay, so there's three different things. Does anybody have any questions about any of those three? So if you haven't started working on some of these, you might want to start because it's, it's like I said, these middle weeks, there's not a whole lot to do with community. Okay, like last week, we only had a quiz. This week, we have a quiz and an NCLEX. Okay, so this is a good time to start working on some of those other bigger projects. Right, 10% of your homework grade is due in weeks nine and 10. That HESI prep is worth 5%. Your vulnerable populations is worth 5%. All right. What else was I going to say? Um, oh, I'm going to be turning on the homework grades probably midweek in the next couple of days. So you, why do I turn on homework grades? Why do homework grades get turned on? So we have that red on our grade. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you can see how your homework. Now, granted, we have had, after this week, we, we will have had one exam, four quizzes after today, four quizzes, two NCLEXs, and a case study. Those are all your KGAs, okay? So when I turn on the homework grades, you're gonna be able to, well, for homework, it would be two NCLEXs and a case study. So you're gonna be able to see how those three grades affect your overall grade. Does that make sense? If you're doing if you're doing well on the NCLEXs and turning in high scores and you've done well in your case study, it should bump your grade up. Okay, but if you're not, you're going to see your grade go down. And the reason we post, I usually leave it up for about a week 
is so that you can see how your homework is affecting your overall grade. Does that make sense? Okay, questions. Okay, let's do, let's start out by doing quiz four. Uh, it's all loaded for you to do. Um, take 15 minutes. Let's see, it's 110. We'll go to 125. Um, but you can open up your quiz and start working on it. So you got to stay on camera. Okay, stay on camera. And when you're done, just at least keep your camera on. If you have to go take a break, whatever. But you got to stay on camera during your quiz. And then don't forget to hit submit. We can't review it. Um, so we'll do our quiz and then we'll cover uh, our week eight content. And then we're going to, we're going to spend some time on the HESI prep study guide. And then I'm going to go through the exam two study guide with you, or at least the organization of it and kind of tips for preparing for the exam. How's that sound? All right. Get working on your quiz and I'll see you in a few minutes.
Hi, Professor. Um, I requested a breakout because before class, I was just getting everything ready, like uh, getting opening the quiz portion on the module, and I accidentally uh click click take the quiz and it open. I didn't know the quiz was open, so mm -hmm. I exited back. Out, I I exited out, but when when I went to go take it just now, like eighteen minutes had elapsed already, so I didn't want yeah. like it looking like I had already went and took the quiz. Before okay. class started or are you taking like it now are you taking it now oh i'm sorry could you say that could you say that again my volume was down I no i said are you taking it now well i just said yeah i just submitted it okay all right that's fine okay, okay. i'm going to put you back okay okay
Anybody still working on the quiz? Okay, if everybody can come back on camera, we can review the quiz. So a lot of what's in the quiz today is occupational and environmental health, which is what we're gonna cover, okay? So let's see how you, okay. <clears throat> can everybody see my screen? Yes? Yes. Okay. Okay, uh, which statement is true regarding children involving environmental health hazards? What's the correct answer? Their proximity to the ground increases the risk of toxic exposure. Okay, why? Why is that the correct answer? What do we because, know about kids and environmental Because they're health? closer to, environment. closer to the ground. Yeah. So everything that's on the ground, they're going to be exposed to. Or put in their mouths or, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. And one of the things we think about is uh, lead paint chips, right? Um, okay, great. Number two, during a home health visit for a pregnant client, the nurse notes the client's husband regularly uses pesticides at work, which nursing intervention is a priority. So before we answer that, what are your clues in the question that you would pull out? Let's say you use the highlighter. This is an exam question and you use the highlighter. What are you gonna highlight in this question? What's important? Priority. Priority. Priority is one. Pregnant. Pregnant is two. And he, and he works with pesticides. And he works with pesticides. The, so there's your three clues in that question. All right, so if you were taking the exam and this was an exam question and you're using the highlighter, you would highlight those three parts of the question. You got three hints. So what's the correct answer? The first one. That he removed the clothes outside and doesn't let the pregnant wife touch them. Okay. Yep, that is the correct answer. Now, some students select B. Okay. Could B be, be a correct answer? If there was not priority in the in the question, okay. The reason why I asked that is this is a good example of a question that there's potentially another answer that looks like it could be in the ballpark to be correct, right? And so, if you're down to two answers and you they both look correct, um, what should you do? Read back the question. Reread Re the question and see if anything pops out at you. Or you exactly. can highlight it. <laughs> That's exactly right. And it's asking. When I look, when, I'm sorry. When I looked at this question, I was thinking about COVID when I worked during COVID. So I remember when I had COVID, when I was working through that COVID season, I came home and took off all my clothes and everything outside, yep. like in the garage before I came in the house. Yep. So that's yep. what I thought. I about yep. that. And it's asking what the priority is. So the priority would be the first line of exposure was removing your clothes before you even come into the house, right? It could be recommended that you avoid using pesticides at home or outside in the yard. That could be correct. But what is more of a priority? Removing your... All, so priority is you always should think prevention first. In no. the community? Priority, you would think priority first. First, what's priority? Mm -hmm. Priority is what's the most important thing you would do That's first. Mm -hmm. Right? In fact, this quiz is full of priority questions. All right, so let's pick apart these questions. The home health nurse works in a community with high rates of complex chronic illnesses and neurological disorders. 
which environmental characteristic is a priority? So what are you gonna highlight in this question before we even get to the answer? Priority. Priority is one word you'd highlight. What else are you gonna yeah. highlight? Complex chronic illnesses and neurological so, disorders. Right, so it's specifically telling you um, what kinds of clients we're dealing with. Clients with complex chronic illnesses and neurological disorders. The other key word in here is environmental. Okay, so we're thinking environmental, all right, and priority. Okay, so what's the correct answer? Say that again. Presence of several manufacturing plants. Okay. Yep. Why is that the correct answer? What What's the risk here? Um, a lot of manufacturing plants. I'm not sure who's speaking, but speak up a little bit. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm sick, Professor. So I'm trying to. Oh. Okay. But I was talk. I was saying about the several manufacturing plants. Um, in the community. And why is that a risk? Well, it actually gives you a hint near the community's river. Okay, when we think about environmental risks, the biggest thing, the, the things we think about, the four major most common are water contamination, air pollution, soil contamination, and food, foodborne illnesses. All right, so presence of several manufacturing plants near the community's river could poten potentially present risks. For the last one could water. be a good answer as well. Pardon me? The last one, the use of the water filters in the community residence home. Okay, but that's actually a good thing, right? Oh, uh, I was reading it wrong. Yeah, yeah, that's a good thing. Okay, and we know that B is incorrect because that is 1978. Homes and school buildings built before then. Okay. All right, number four, nurses reinforcing education about a diabetic diet, which client statement indicates a barrier to learning. So a couple of questions. What kind of question is this? Is this a positively framed question or a negatively framed question? Negatively. Why? Because it's asking what, like, I guess a, a barrier, a barrier is something that stops you. So mm -hmm. something that's going to stop the client from doing what we're asking them to do. Right. So you're looking for something negative, something they're doing that's not correct or incorrect, right? This is the equivalent of a question that says, you know, you've done your your discharge teaching. What does the client say that makes that indicates they need further education? Right. So you're looking for something negative. So what are the key words you would highlight in this question? Barrier to learning. Barrier. Mm-hmm. What else? Diabetic. Diabetic diet. That's what we're talking about here. Okay. So what is the correct answer? I think I would rather use the keto diet instead of this one. Right. What does that tell you? If the client, if after you've done your diabetic teaching, diabetic diet teaching with your client, and then the client states this, what what does that tell you? They have a resistance to what we just taught them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Does everybody understand that? You got to be able to uh, pull out negatively framed questions where you're looking for something that's actually that somebody is doing that's actually incorrect. Can't tell you the number of times I review exams with students and they have a negatively asked question and they just didn't pick up on that the negative part of it, okay? Which nursing intervention will enhance the learning for a client who speaks English as a second language? 
So what would you highlight in this question? What kind of client are we talking about? A client who has English as a second language. So think language barrier. Think, put yourself in the spot of teaching a family discharge instructions about something and there's a language barrier. How are you going to get through? What are you going to do? How are you going to help to make sure that this client understands the discharge instructions? What would you do? Create a pamphlet in the client's sign language. Did you say create a pamphlet, Joy? Is that what yes. you said? Yes. Okay. And so, yeah. So, why is that the correct answer? And why are the other ones incorrect? Because that's an intervention to enhance it and it's in their language. You right. Know? It's in their language, it's in their primary language. One of the things you need to think about is all your interactions with with different clients. You are, you know, with all the cultural diversity and different cultures we're working with, you are going to be working with clients that do not speak English as a primary language. So what are your strategies? What's your creativity and your strategies of how to work with that? So create a pamphlet in their primary language. That would be the most helpful, Right. If you look at A, providing a recording uh, of the teaching to view later, well, if that's in English, it's not gonna make any difference, right? They don't understand the language. So that's not gonna work. Sure, you can include the family in the teach back session, but if it's not in their primary language, that's not gonna be effective either, correct? Right, and giving the client a dictionary to learn vocabulary. I mean, that's kind of absurd. Um, we have to come up with ways to be able to communicate in the client's primary language. Okay, so that's why that answer is correct. Okay, the home health nurse is reinforcing education on the use of a glucometer. Which approaches would be most effective? What are you gonna highlight in that question? Most effective. Most effective. Okay, this is an education question. Reinforcing education. What's going to be most effective? The reinforcing education on the glucometer. Mm -hmm. So what's the answer? Demonstrate using the glucometer and then observe the client if right. they do it correctly. That's the teach back method, right? Why is that the most the most important way of re, of um, reinforcing education? It's because hands on. Sure. It's that hands on, right? Go ahead, Mariana. Well, it just ensures that they they know the instruction. You see that they understand. Mm -hmm. Um, providing a pamphlet describing the functions and features, that's fine. However, what if they can't read? What if they can't comprehend? What if English is their second language? They're not going to understand the pamphlet, correct? Right? Referring the client to a support group with other clients who have diabetes. Mm, I guess you could do that. Um, maybe after maybe after they've demonstrated the proper use of it, right? But if they don't understand how to use the glucometer, referring to a support group is not going to really help the situation. Uh, creating a video of nursing uh, nurse describing the gl glucometer use in a schedule. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, a lot of people go to YouTube and find videos on how to do a lot of things, right? But the question is asking which would be most effective, working with the client, showing them how to use it, and having them re-demonstrate. This is the way we, I did all my diabetic teaching in the schools, especially with the younger kids. Okay, showing them how to do it and then doing the return demonstration from them. 
And you guys have heard about the teach back method. That's what that is. Uh, home health nurses reinforcing education for an eight-year-old with type 1 diabetes. Which approach will be most effective? There's some key cues in this in this question. What are they? Who's the client? An eight-year-old. Eight-year-old. So you need to be thinking growth and development, right? What and the other um, important word in there is most effective. So you're thinking eight year old. So in in your going back to your growth and development knowledge, what's the what's the most effective way to reinforce education for an eight year old? With toys. Yep. We used to, when I was working with the younger kids on teaching them how to do insulin shots, we used to use like a little pillow, right? Or they would bring in a stuffed animal. They would practice on those kinds of items, okay? The other answers are inappropriate growth and development for an eight-year-old. They, they don't do long comprehensive sessions we would not teach just the parents rather than the child. We want the child involved, especially if it's diet reinforcing education with regards to diabetes, because we want to move the child towards eventual independence, right? So we want the child involved. And then kids at eight year kids that are eight years old are not going to be plowing through written pamphlets. Okay. Which intervention um, hang on. I don't know why. Nursing inter which nursing intervention is a priority for a client who is not motivated? What are the key words in this question? Priority. Priority. And what else? Maybe. Not motivated. Okay. So you have a client here who is not motivated. What is the priority for us as nurses to um, establish first? We've talked about this before in class. What's the most important thing to do? Trust. Establishing Stop. trust and rapport. Right. Right. Okay, number nine. So this is an occupational health question. I don't know why my dots are, hang on. All right, so you have an occupational health nurse. What's occupational health? Where Where is, where is the evaluations taking place? Where does occupational health happen? A rehabilitation center? Okay, more specific though. In general, where is occupational health? At home? The work setting. Okay, occupational health is work settings. Okay, so if you're the occupational health nurse and you're caring for a client who comes to you and reports lower back pain, that's worse at the end of the workday, which intervention is a priority? So what are you gonna highlight in this question? Well, one, it's important to know that you're working with an occupational health nurse. So you make the assumption that this is in the work setting, right? They're reporting lower back pain. That's important. And it's at the end of the work day. That's important. And so what's your priority? What do, what do you want to assess? Okay. Lifting techniques. Right. What might be going on? Not using proper body mechanics. Yeah, they may need to, I mean, first, the, the first priority is to assess whether they're, do they know how to lift correctly? Do they have the proper body mechanics, right? That's first. We wouldn't, we wouldn't provide the list of local therapists in the area. That's not up to us. We don't even know what's going on yet, Right or recommend the use of, of medication. Again, we don't know what's going on. 
and then obtain a referral for expert medical evaluation. We're not at that point yet. Okay, first we have to assess whether they have the correct techniques in lifting, right? Lower back pain at the end of the day. All right, which statement is true regarding the scheduling of client education? Do we wanna do it on our terms or on the patient's terms, client's terms? Patient's terms. Why? Because they'll be more receptive if they're comfortable. Okay. Yep. And maybe they want family members present for that education. Okay. Anybody have a different answer than B on this question? Right. It's most important when the, when the client is most comfortable. Okay. Okay, how'd you do? Okay. All right, I first want to take us, can you see my screen here? Yes. I, I, I wanna review, before we look at our notes, I wanna review our module reading on occupational environmental health. Okay, to give a, kind of a background. All right. So let's start with occupational environmental health nursing it is a specialty practice that provides for and delivers health safety programs and services to workers, worker population and community groups. So the workers and worker populations uh, apply to occupational health and community groups apply to environmental health. Think about it. Think about all of the environmental risks. Well, let's start with occupation. Think of all the occupational risks in a workplace. Think about all the environmental risks in our communities that we don't even think about, okay? Um, so the uh, occupational and environmental health focuses on the promotion and restoration of health, preventative illness, preventing injury, and protection of work-related environmental hazards. They kind of go hand in hand, right? Um, I don't think we need to go through the history, but we know that poor employee health costs run near $1 trillion annually, right? So, so large corporations and business executives look to the occupational environmental health nurses to maximize productivity, right? We want to keep, we want to keep employees at work. We want to keep them healthy. We want to have them performing proficiently in their jobs. We want to minimize injuries. Okay. We want to lower absenteeism rates. Okay, so occupational environmental nursing is critical to the healthcare team. All right, they have very specific responsibilities. Okay. Part of their responsibilities is case management. What's a case manager? What's a case manager? Case manager is probably someone who works with the nurse, uh, with the patient one on one with uh, his or her family. Okay. Um, okay. Socially uh, and families to like better them. Yep. So the general definition of a case manager, they're kind of the coordinator of care. All right. We have case managers in all the facilities we work in. Okay. So they are the coordinator of care. So let's say you have a somebody who is ill or has been injured at work. Okay. The case manager collaborates and coordinates the whole process with regards to maybe the workers compensation what kind of leave they're going to be taking working with the physicians on when employees can return to work i mean how do you think all this happens we all know somebody has been injured on the job or has had to take a leave of absence who coordinates all that that's the that's the occupational environmental case manager 
All right. So their goal is to monitor the injury or illness, try and uh, working with the employee to figure out when they're coming back to work. How does that look? Can they come back in full duty to their prior job? Do they have to come back in a limited duty capacity? And the, the case manager has to figure all that out. Look at discharge instructions. What are, are there any restrictions that need to be placed on the employee of what they can and what they cannot do? What do they need to be retrained on? Let's say they had a back injury from an injury at work. Right, the case manager is going to be organizing some retraining on body mechanics and lifting. Okay, so there's a lot for that case manager that works with occupational environmental uh, health issues to coordinate. Right, there's a lot that goes on if for an injury on the job or a leave of absence or whatever. A lot going on. Um, the occupational environmental nurse may also be doing counseling and crisis intervention. Think about it. There are lots and lots and lots of people out there with substance abuse issues, mental health issues, right? They bring that to work. Maybe not intentionally. Okay, so there may be counseling and crisis intervention. So besides counseling workers about injuries and returning to work, right? They're also counseling with regards to substance abuse, psycho psychosocial needs, wellness and health promotion concerns, work-related concerns. And most big organizations have they're called EAPs, Employee Assistance Programs, right? Which are resources to help employees follow up with crises in their life, um, therapy, whatever they need. Okay, so that occupational environmental health nurse is also responsible for counseling crisis intervention. They also... Um, play an important role in health promotion and risk reduction. They may do seminars or education uh, programs with regards to positive lifestyle changes, right? Lifestyle changes that may reduce the risk of disease and injury. Balance, balancing work and personal life. Okay, smoking cessation. Reducing obesity, exercise, fitness, nutrition, weight control, stress management, maybe monitoring for chronic diseases, management of chronic diseases. Okay, think about it. At your at your employer, most big organizations now have I don't they're called different things, but health and wellness departments. We had one in our big school district where there were always seminars and programs on prevention right? Supporting a positive lifestyle that employees could take advantage of. And think about what we're talking about. We're talking about the workplace, occupational environmental health. So it does, it, it is a positive aspect when you can focus on primary, right? Your primary interventions, preventing something before it happens. So if you're able to do, if you're able to attend seminars on weight loss and exercise you know, or even substance abuse um drug use for the for the population that's that is in the work environment it only can help okay the other the other responsibility the occupational environmental safety nurse has is to be aware of what legal and regulatory compliance looks like within their organization it could be a hospital it could be a bank it could be a, a hair salon right every working environment has legal and regulatory compliance guidelines they need to follow and those are usually put forward by OSHA. Okay, so OSHA, everybody's heard of OSHA, right? Occupational Safety and Health Administration, right? What anybody, 
has anybody had a visit from OSHA or has participated in something with OSHA? They're responsible for enforcing that the, that the workplace, wherever it is, is following the safety and environmental health guidelines that have been set out. Does that make sense? So for example, in a hospital, if you have unexpected, maybe an unexpected death in the OR, you have a high risk of falls at a certain unit. Maybe you have visitors that are slipping, coming into the facility. Those are all occupational and environmental issues that OSHA is going to get involved with. Has anybody ever been a, part a participant in an OSHA visit? Okay. For an issue in your workplace? Yes. Yeah, tell me about it. What happened? What was the issue? Um, it was an incident with um, a client um, a two feeder with maggots and things like that, and okay. uh, they came and visited. Yeah, to make sure you're. Go ahead. But I do know that we did have a visit from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any kind of violations of occupational safety, environmental issues are gonna require a visit from OSHA. They need to, it's an investigative body. What was going on were proper protocols followed. You know, if there was a chemical spill or, I mean, think of all the different things that can happen in the work setting, okay? So OSHA, their primary responsibility is to recognize and identify hazards, monitor, evaluate, and analyze these hazards by conducting research, on what are the effects of workplace exposure. Gather, think of the nursing process here, gather the data, use the data to try and figure out what happened or what's going on. Some examples, like I mentioned, toxic chemical exposures, work-related accidents. They're trying to detect patterns and trends and changes. I mean, there was a lot of OSHA activity going on through the pandemic, right? To make sure facilities were following the COVID protocols. Okay, if you had excess deaths of COVID patients, OSHA was involved in that. Okay. And here's a nice little visual of standards of occupational environmental health nursing, okay? This is taking your nursing process and putting it and applying it to occupational environmental health nursing. So in, a in the assessment phase, right? So the occupational environmental nurse assesses the health status of the client, Right, and then the nurse and the same nurse analyzes the assessment to formulate a diagnosis. And then outcome identification, based on the assessment and the analysis, we identify outcomes specific to clients. And then we develop a plan, goal-directed plan, that has interventions to try and get to the expected outcomes. Right? Then we implement our interventions, trying to attain the desired outcomes. Okay, and our obviously evaluation is, how are we doing? How are the responses to our intervention? Are we, are we progressing towards our goals? Okay. So that's your... Um, That's your kind of introduction reading. All right, so let's see what we did or didn't cover here. So this is your notes, your weekly notes. Those are the four concepts we're covering. So you had the canvas reading on occupational and environmental health that we just went through. <clears throat> so in review, with an occupational health nurse, I'm breaking it down here more specifically to the occupational health nurse and then environmental health. 
right? So we know that the occupational health nurse is working within the work setting, right? One of the things that the occupational health nurse needs to be aware of are what are job descriptions, right? Think, think about a hospital. Think about how many job descriptions there are in a hospital and how different these job descriptions are all the way from food service to environmental services to transport services to radiology, OR, med surge floor, business office, lab. All right, think of all the different job descriptions. Well, the occupational health nurse or department needs to be aware of what's in those job descriptions because ultimately they are the ones responsible for making sure people are prepared in whatever job description they have. Does that make sense? And that's why occupational nursing is such a key part of the healthcare team. Okay. Do they understand job descriptions? Do they understand the hazards within each of those job descriptions? Is it lifting? Is it working with potential hazards, potential spills? You know, when we all start a new job, we all work with the occupational health department, right? We make sure our immunizations are up to date. We make sure our training is up to date. We make sure our licensure is up to date. That's all within the occupational department, all right? So an occupational health nurse is going to see various illnesses, various injuries that are required from employment. And one thing to remember is there's really no work setting that is completely risk-free, whether it's a hospital, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a long-term care facility, no work, no work site is completely risk-free. Every single industry has its risks. <clears throat> We talked about case management, um, counseling. We talked about counseling and crisis intervention. Health promotion and risk reduction. We talked about that. Okay. Talked about that in our introduction. Legal and regulatory compliance. Okay. Whatever the federal or state regulations are with regards to safety in the workplace will be look will be enforced by OSHA. Okay. Um, worker and workplace hazard detection, right? They this goes through once again the the nursing process here of occupational nursing, being able to recognize hazards, monitor it, evaluate it, implement changes. Let's say, let's say there was a death in the OR. They're going to come in and do their investigation and make recommendations. Those recommendations are expected to take place. And then they will come back and do a visit to make sure their recommendations have been put in place. Okay, here's a couple of examples of some preventions from primary, secondary, tertiary regarding occupational health. So primary, maybe teach coping mechanisms. Mechanisms of people are coming to work with high stress levels, high uh, personal issues, maybe teaching coping mechanisms, okay, providing healthy diet education, education on lifting, proper lifting, education on proper protective PPE use. Maybe secondary, if, P if you're working in a, a big plant, let's say a car plant or a loud plant, lots of noise. Part of your responsibility as the occupational nurse is to do screening for hearing loss, right? Maybe you work in a facility that has lots and lots of obese workers. Maybe you're doing blood pressure screening, screening for stress, screening for burnout. Okay, these are interventions from the occupational health nurse. And then tertiary, something's already happened. They've had an illness, injury, diagnosis, um, evaluating when they can come back to work. I said this earlier, whether can they come back in a limited duty, right? And if they can, what training are they going to, what retraining are they going to need 
to come back to full duty. And the example here is, let's say somebody's had surgery for carpal tunnel, right? What do they need to come back? Do they need specific education as to how to position their body when they're sitting? Do they need wrist splints for their carpal tunnel? Do they need a, if they've had a back injury, do they need a back brace? And this is all in conjunction with working with the physicians, all right? Meaning that the nurse needs to be aware of what's going on before prior to them even re-entering the work workplace. Okay. Um, specifically to environmental health, um, we know that environmental hazards are responsible for over one half of the total burden of disease in the world. Amazing. It contributes to over 80% of communicable and non-communicable diseases and injury. These are environmental health risks. We know that kids are much more vulnerable to environmental hazards, right? And this was one of your um, quiz questions. The exposures are more likely to lead to adverse health outcomes for kids. And then think about environmental health exposures during pregnancy. It may affect fetal development, okay? Kids are much more vulnerable to environmental hazards should always be considered, that should be considered primary. And that was your quiz question, right? Environmental health is determined several different ways. Genetics, maybe your socioeconomic status, and environmental exposures, okay? Why would socioeconomic status influence environmental health? Several reasons. People who live in poverty, families who live in poverty, they're more likely to be exposed to environmental hazards, maybe due to overcrowded living conditions. Maybe they're living closer to a hazardous waste site, having poorer quality of foods available, having more, potentially having more hazardous jobs, living in older homes with lead-based paint or going to school in districts where there are real old buildings. Okay, genetics could play a part in environmental risks, history of developmental delays, history of autism. Okay, think about it. Just think about for a minute where you live in your community. For me, I live near a major, major highway. <clears throat> So the air, the air quality is poor. Okay, but think of the environmental risks in your own communities. You live near an airport. You live near a waste site, industrial, agriculture, water. You don't really think about those every day. Right, you just make assumption, assumptions that the water you're drinking is safe, the air you're breathing is healthy, but that's not the case. Okay, so if you're doing an environmental assessment for an individual or a family, what kinds of things do you wanna know? What kinds of things during your assessment part of your nursing process, what do you wanna know? What kinds of things are important as part of your assessment so you can make your plan? You want to know where they live, right? Why? Okay. Why do you want to know where they live? Maybe to like assess what kind of, like what type of environment they're living in. Right. What's in their environment that's going to be at risk? right? Where they work. Why is that important? You want to know what they're maybe exposed to at work. Chemicals right? and stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, what about school? Where they go to school, where their kids go to school. Why is that important? What risk? What they're exposed to. Possibly. Exactly. Exactly. 
Yeah, and same with daycare facilities, right? So asking where they live, work, go to school. What about dietary history? Is that important? Why? What risks are there with dietary hazards? Or excuse me, with dietary um, dietary risks? Say they live near a river, or stream, fishing. They're fishing in contaminated waters and eating eating their dinner from that. What risks do those pose from an environmental health standpoint? Right? Just things we don't think about. Right? But if you're out in the community and you're doing your home visits and doing an, um, an environmental assessment, these are the things you need to know, right? So originally, you'd be out there doing a windshield survey, which is what we've talked about before is surveying the surveying the demographics of where you are and what what you notice, what what's going on. that are potential exposures. Think about all the stuff we have in our homes, in our garages, pesticides, herbicides, right? Under our kitchen sink. Those all pose environmental risks, right? <clears throat> And you had a question about the lead-based paint. Okay, and the kids being exposed to primarily, kids being um, the highest risk of exposure. Well, that all so goes for schools and daycare facilities. And we talked about pesticides used in the home, schools, daycares, hospitals. Um, Let's, what about food? Let's talk about that for a minute. What about, uh, I don't know about you, but when I go through a drive through or go to a restaurant, I make the assumption that everything is prepared the way it's supposed to be. Do you? I do. Right, but one of the a big environmental issue is food, food poisoning, right? Or food issues. Okay, so who monitors how everything's working in a restaurant to make sure everything is done the correct way? And what happens if there's food poisoning or a food an outbreak? I'm just things you don't think about every day, right? But in the community setting, we do think about these things. Okay, it's estimated that 30 million Americans drink water that don't meet the EPA standards. What's the EPA? What's the EPA? Got to know this. Your Environmental Protection Agency, right? They're the federal agency that sets the standards for safe drinking water. Um, let's switch gears to learning, barriers to learning. So one of the things that we do all throughout our career is patient education, right? It's one of the most important roles of a nurse, right? We use education to promote health, prevent illness and injury, improve healthy related behaviors, enable clients to take care of themselves and family members, right? Taking personal responsibility for their health. Okay, education empowers the patients with knowledge and hopefully motivation that helps them take more personal responsibility for what they have going on. Okay, one of the biggest barriers for patient education is what we call low literacy. What do I mean by that? What does that mean? Low literacy. What's literacy? Being able to comprehend or read. What, Joy? Um, you said what could be a barrier, maybe don't being able to um, read or comprehend. Right. Right. So literacy, really important. 
Okay, because it's such a big barrier in so many cases. Okay, whether it's a language barrier, right? Not speaking the language, whether it's an education barrier, not having an education that you can read or comprehend. So if that's the case, how are you going to understand? How are you going to understand what's being taught to you on admission, taught to you on discharge? How are you going to comprehend your discharge orders? You can't. You can't. Right? So you would have to verbalize it to you, like, but that's if you don't have the infanted, not the, the, the language barrier either. So if you have a language barrier and you can't read and write, then you're, right. you're totally in problems. Yeah, absolutely. And so we often deal with populations who are either illiterate, and I mean healthy literate, who have low literacy levels that can't even understand our teaching. Right. Maybe they're embarrassed to admit they can't read. Um, maybe they just kind of go along with, you know, acting like they understand what's going on. Right. So what could we do? What do we do when we're in those situations? Resources. What kind of resources? What are we looking for? Language line. Okay. That's what we have in the hospitals. What is it called? Language line? We have a, um, they have a new thing now in the hospitals where it's like an iPad. Okay. And, and it has like all the languages. You pick the language and a person comes up and talks and says everything you say to the patient. Oh, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay. In their primary language. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. It has, it has a lot of language, languages you've never heard of. Verdict is so many languages. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. That's a, that's a great resource because ultimately you have to find a way to communicate in the primary language, right? This is one of your quiz questions as well. Okay. Um, a, another, another idea is interpreters. You know, if you work in a big organization, they usually have an interpreter, interpreter services, or can contract with interpreter services, or maybe a family member who can help. Okay. Uh, um, another barrier besides literacy is motivation. How do you get people motivated to learn that? How do you get people to learn that aren't motivated? What do you do? You have all, wor you've all worked trust. with clients that are not motivated, <laughs> right? Kristen, right? What do you do? Let's say, let's say somebody's been diagnosed with severe high blood pressure or uh, cardiovascular disease or something has happened that puts them at high risk for a stroke. You know, a serious, some serious diagnosis. And they're still not motivated to make a change or what do you do? How do you motivate them? Big issue. I would say build that trust, um, therapeutic communication. Mm -hmm. um, that would be my go-to. That's one. Yep. Well, that's an issue that needs to happen. What else? Uh, find out what it is that they um that has them, um, you know, not wanting to cooperate and try to make adjustments, make them feel yep. comfortable. Yeah, I mean, do they even understand what's going on? Do they understand the severity of their new condition or new diagnosis? Do they understand that if they do A, B, and C, they're going to lower their risk for long-term outcomes. I mean, first, you know, motivation may, lack of motivation may come from just being health illiterate. They don't really understand. But once you give them the information and the tools and the resources to work towards a more positive outcome, those are some suggestions. And then other issues, other barriers are maybe 
cultural, maybe cultural values, beliefs, expectations may pay, play a part in being a barrier, right? All different cultures have different ways they look at foods, um, practice issues, uh, visitors, topics that can be covered. And so that has to be looked at as well, right? The cultural values and beliefs. Um, and then another barrier is self-confidence, right? I'll never, I'll never remember that. I'll never know how to do that. I'll never learn how to do that. Okay. So that's something else to deal with is lack of self-confidence. And we've all worked with clients that lack confidence, have we not? Okay, so there's three different domains. We're almost done here. Three different domains of learning, okay? Um, we all possess all three, but usually one is more prevalent than the other two. Okay, we have our cognitive domain, our affective domain, and our psychomotor domain. And you're going to get asked about this, this question about this on the next exam. So have an understanding of these and really a basic understanding. Cognitive is the thinking. Okay. Thinking part. Okay. The ability to hear information, read information, understand it, memorize it, and use that information to solve problems. That's cogn cognitively thinking through something. Okay. Affective is the feeling part. Right. Whatever your attitudes, uh, beliefs, values are, that will affect your ability to learn. Let's say you're participating in a program of something that, I don't know, you don't agree with or your values challenge that. Um, does that get in the way of you learning? Okay. And then the last one is psychomotor. I'm a psychomotor learner. I'm hands-on. I like to do things. Okay. I like to practice. You know, I always use the example of, of using a clicker. I can't figure out two different clickers. I can't figure it out. Follow my kids. What do I do? What do I do? I, I just, I need to have hands on. You can't tell me over the phone how to do something. All right. So psychomotor, remember psychomotor, it's the moving part. It's learning a skill through practice and practice, right? So an example would be trying to teach a kid how to use a glucometer. That was one of your quiz questions, right? The teach back, hands on. So if you're asked about psychomotor, remember, psycho is simply the doing, okay? It doesn't have anything to do with cognitive or affective. It's the doing, okay? Um, and then reinforcing health education. Um, I think we've already covered most of this. Um, when do we start discharge planning? The very beginning. Mm -hmm. On admission, right? Um, and then when you have a minute, have a look at these prevention levels, primary, secondary, and tertiary with regards to education. Okay, I'm gonna have you guys look at that on that last part, those last bullets, because I want to jump to um, our HESI prep assignment. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about the content? Okay. So as you're preparing, hopefully you've already started this, but um, as you're preparing to complete this, remember, this isn't just a assignment to give you more work. This is actually your going to be your study guide for HESI. Okay. I have gone through the HESI and the actually the ones that have X's in them are new, not new. Well, kind of tweaked. I, I can take a look at the HESIs after every term and see what topics they're asking about. I have no idea what the questions are, okay, because I don't have anything to do with the HESI, developing a HESI exam. But I can, but I am aware of the topics that are addressed, okay? So that's what these boxes represent. These boxes represent topics that have questions asked about it. Okay, so as you're completing this, it, we've actually completed weeks one through six now. So I'd say at least half of this can be completed already. And this is meant to be a work in progress document. Okay, so you, there's no right way 
or wrong way to complete this. Okay. All I'm asking you is to think nursing process, think ad pyres you're going through each of those. So like anthrax, first up, anthrax. What do we want to know about anthrax? What are we going to get asked about anthrax? Maybe I'm thinking out loud with the nursing process. Maybe what the client might present with. Maybe how it's transmitted. How to, contact, how to get in contact with it. Yep. Yep. How it's treated. Right. So, so just think of a client presenting with that when you have a particular topic like anthrax or down here um, uh, or where was this is the other thing too, is this is very med surge focused. This HESI, where was my other one? Home health. All right. So you got an anthrax patient. Let's say you're doing an NG2 feeding. What do we want to think about? What do we want to know? What kinds of things do you want to know about NG tube feeding? You have to go back to med search here. Okay. Respite care, falling in the home. Be thinking falling in the home. If I'm looking, what question might they ask about falling in the home? Maybe how do you do an assessment? How do you do a safety assessment? If there's any clutter on the ground. Exactly. Are there any risks? Right? Below the knee, amputation, home care assessment. What are you looking for? COPD, right? That's how I want you to look at this. Let's say you were you were going into a home to take care of a patient with a below the knee, knee uh, amputation, a patient with COPD, a patient that has a risk of falling in ho home, a patient that's receiving respite care. What what are you assessing? I mean, what are you looking for? Does that make sense? There's, like I said, there's no right way or wrong way to do this. You just need to be able to think about what questions, what might they say about, uh, what are they asking about food stamps and WIC? Um, I'm not sure the specific questions, but maybe who's eligible? What are they? And how can it help the kids and the families? How can it help the kids and the family? Meals on wheels. Who does it serve? How does it help? Elderly. Who qualify? Yeah, exactly. Right, health promotion, elderly diet. Well, there's a way to there's a way we teach the elderly population about a healthy diet. You know, certain foods to, uh, you know, certain foods to avoid, certain foods to load up on. Okay. This is heart failure, heart failure, home care. What are we What are we going to observe if we're going no into? If we're going in to take care of a client who's in heart failure and they're still in the home setting, you're the nurse going in there. What are you going to assess? You're probably going to assess color, right? Vital signs, right? So just, just think clinically, okay? Take the knowledge that you have about these topics, okay? And I realize we haven't covered all of these topics specifically in class, we've covered a lot of them, but they fall under the concept. Like it's broken out into, we haven't done, we haven't done disaster and bioterrorism. I think that's coming up next week. All right. So we really haven't done this yet, but I may not talk about red tag triage, but it's part of the concept of disaster management. Does that make sense? So don't be looking here saying, oh, she didn't do that. She didn't do that. It's all part of the concept. You're going to have to do your own research as well. Make sense? Epidemiology, we really haven't covered yet. I think that's coming up in the next few weeks. So there's not really much you can do there unless you want to go ahead. I mean, think about your three books. You have your fundamentals book, you have your med surge book, and you have your maternity and peds book. Every single topic on this HESI prep is in those books. So if you want to go ahead, please feel free to do that. We have covered quite a bit of <clears throat> health promotion and teaching. <clears throat> so there's things that there are boxes you can fill out here, like conjunctivitis. That's easy. You guys did your common childhood ailments you and go right back. Think about, think about if you picked conjunctivitis as one of your three common childhood ailments, which a lot of people did you already have the answer to, you already have what you need to put in this box, 
right? So don't make this a difficult assignment. Think study guide. If you're going to end up, if you end up doing it at the last minute, you're just trying to find stuff to put in there, probably isn't going to be very, very beneficial. But if you take your time and do it kind of methodically throughout the term or going forward, it's going to become your, your study guide. Does that make sense? And that's why I say, that's why I tell you about this in week one, work on it, work on it throughout the term. And if you haven't started it yet, I suggest you start it. Okay. Eczema was school sports. That was in the eczema part of common childhood ailments, lead poisoning. Okay. Seatbelt safety, adolescents, health teaching, adolescents. That's all back in that chapter from growth and development. It was chapter 11 in your fundamentals book, I believe. So it's all there for you. Um, but that's the way, that's the way this works. You can, as much as you put into it, you're going to get out of it. Okay. And it's not meant to be a gotcha assignment. It's meant to be, oh, well, what are they going to, they're going to, they're asking a question about anthrax incubation. What might I get asked, asked with regards to clinical judgment? So that would be a patient presenting with possible anthrax exposure. Okay, I'm going to get a question about level one, two, and three disasters. I probably should know what a level one is, a level two, and a level three. Disaster planning. Probably should know what are the most important factors in disaster planning. What's red tag versus orange tag versus white tag? So do you want us to put them as questions or questions and information you can do whatever you want that's what i'm saying is okay. you need to be able to take the 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 knowledge that you know about anthrax which you don't really know now because we haven't covered it and put it into put it into some guidelines of what you think is most important to know i'm going to post um a completed hesse prep assignment from a couple of students. Well, I have a couple of real good ones from last term that I'll post as a kind of an example. All right. But this is meant to help you. This is, this is, this is, this will be your document you're using prior to HESI. And this is the document I use when I do a HESI prep or I do a HESI review. Okay. So questions about that. Does that give more clarification? Yes. So each of these boxes represents a topic that's being asked about. So then you have to think about what might I be asked about <clears throat> in the clinical setting. <clears throat> okay. So quality care, high school population. Okay. So that would tell me I should probably investigate and research what's important to the high school population with regards to health. Is that seatbelt safety? Is that um, safe sex education? Is that <clears throat> avoidance of drugs and alcohol? Okay, does that make sense? But think clinical, clinical, okay? Because I can tell you the uh, it's clinically focused and it's med surge, heavily med surge, this HESI. So that's why you have a lot of boxes in here that are med surge. All right. So that's my suggestion of how to attack that. Okay. And then the last, I'm going to, I'm going to do a review here for exam two, but um, just real quick 
it's, uh, I've tried to organize it for you the best I could. All right. Here's your concepts from week four. There's your concepts from week five, concepts from week six. All right. So you're going to be tested. Out, you're going to have questions on all of these right here. Okay. And then I've copy and pasted your readings in case you need a reference to go back to. Week four readings, week five readings, week six. And then I've broken down everything by the week. All right. So th this is more of an abbreviated version of all your notes. I've put this together from lectures, from notes, from readings, right? So it should follow along exactly how it's presented up here, okay? And that's what I'm going to cover in the review. Just go through each of these, okay? It's just, it's lined up exactly like your modules are, okay? And this most of this information should look super familiar to you because we've just covered it all, right? You've been through week six now, so you have weeks four, five, and six. So a, a lot of this information in your study guide you'll have seen in your notes, but it's a more abbreviated version. And I would start with this guide first. And if you have a good understanding of the guide, and you'll do fine on the exam. Remember, it's taking your knowledge and putting it into practice. So start with this review guide and then use your notes and use your readings as additional tools if you need to go back and, and reread those sections. Okay, that's my best advice. Um, my review is in 20 minutes, I think. When's my review? Hang on. Okay, thank you. I think it's two o'clock. Yeah. So my review is in 20 minutes. Okay. So you'll have the, I'll send out the recording of it tonight. So you'll you'll have mine tonight. And then uh, Professor Ford, I think is doing hers Thursday and Professor Kershaw Saturday morning. There's an update with her day and time. So I'll send out, that out in an announcement. So you've got three reviews to try and go to. Okay. So hopefully that's helpful. Is that helpful information? Okay. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And then as you're preparing for exam two, um, you know, next weekend or even Monday, if you're at the point where you're just struggling with some of the concepts and you don't have, quite have a grasp on any of them and you want to schedule a quick tutoring session to go through that, please, please reach out. All right, happy to help with you with that. All right. All right, questions? No, but I need to speak to Professor Marble after we finish. Okay, sounds good. All right, well, I hope you guys have a good rest of the week. Um, <clears throat> and reach out if you need anything, okay? Thank you. You're welcome.